Hey everyone, it's Cassie here. So today I thought for um, not on Sunday, I would um, start from where I left off um, last time with the Arcana. And when I left the prologue last time, um, I found out that there was some dailies which I'm to try a tarot reading with the help of Azra, Nadia, or Julian, and I can check in daily too and coins. Or there's a Wheel of Fortune where I can spin the wheel for a chance to win coins and collect trinkets which unlock special story scenes. Or there's Heart Hunter where I can win a character's heart to get a postcard and complete postcard collections to win prizes like cones and keys. So going to Tara. Alright, so Azra says, Cassie, did you come for a love reading? Surely not. Such things come and go. It's such a success reading that Cassie desires. So it's not even. <laughs> Maybe Cassie could use a happiness reading. I know I could. Says Julian. Well, I'll give her a reading for free. Follow me. Oh, I got a free tarot reading from Azra. Wait, does this cost money if I. like coins? Get your free reading from Azra. Okay, so uh, shall we see what the cards have to say? Let's start with that big heavy baby. Okay. Let's explore the past, present, and future. We'll practice, we'll practice this one. Don't worry, I'm still here. Swipe if you miss me. Tap the cards to shuffle the deck. What do you think they'll say this time? Tap the cards to shuffle the deck. Oh, okay. Tap the cards to cut the deck. Okay. Tap the deck to choose your cards. I am. Nice outside. Choose three cards. One. I hope those are good. <laughs> and I guess. Okay, so I got the, the, the past. Ace of Pentacles. Upright. You may soon experience good luck in the realm of finances, windfalls, new opportunities, and rewards. Bound. Welcome to the prosperity. Welcome to this prosperity with open arms. Now could be the time to make your dreams reality. Okay, and the next one. Um, so the present. Oh, okay. So the past, and the present, and then I guess future. So I get eight of pen eight of pentacles, which is upright. Your attention to detail and willingness to learn make you an ideal student. Your raw talent can be owned. It may be, be time to embark on a new venture or learn a new skill if you have not already begun. Okay. And the future? The Four of Cups reversed. You may have isolated yourself from others, closing your eyes to new opportunities and experiences. It is time to end your self-imposed exile. Engage yourself in the world and you, your heart will soar. Okay. Alright, so I guess I'm done with that reading. Okay. Oh, and I guess I got five new points. Uh, as a, if you come back every day, you'll get a reward. Isn't that nice? Why don't? That is every day. Uh, okay, as a, after you visit several days in a row, you'll get a free reading from someone's special. Uh, special. Why? I can't talk today. My God. Okay. Um, I don't want to do any more of those. Um, I don't know. I'm just. I'll. I'll. Um, just go back to the story. All right. So let's continue the prologue. So uh, number two, the high priestess. I've seen many strange things in my time as the magician's apprentice, but these the events of this night were strangest yet. Seeking a moment's rest, I go upstairs to lie down and slip away lost in a dream. The sky is no more than a slim green line along the endless horizon. Aza sits beside me on the back of a strange beast. Master, where are we? Dark clouds bear down all around the landscape, a shifting sea of rust-colored sand. How does a roof a road of perfect black stone. Far enough from whom I think. Fair enough. For far enough for what? For answers, for clarity, and I need them soon. A storm is coming. He looks out into the distance, his voice coming into a wistful whisper. I strain to see what the path leads, but it keeps changing. Soon there will be a, cro a crossroads. How soon? Where do they lead? Depends which one you take. His hand reaches for mine, but he stops just short. The sands rise around us like, uh, on a chilly wind, lighting up the sky. As if for now, Cassie, rest. I fall into a dreamless slumber. When I wake, dawn light is filtering through the dusty windows. I spent the early hours preparing my things, casting wild shadows on the walls. I am to meet the Countess at the palace for some unknown purpose. I throw on a traveling cloak and hurry outside, dragging the heavy door shut behind me. After last night's intrusion, I turn the first lock and then the second and the third. <laughs> Almost satisfied, I press my right hand to the door and whisper a cross, a cross me not spell. White worlds glow deep within the door, slowly fading into the grain. 
I'm about to leave when I when the hair at the nape of my neck rises in alarm. Oh no. Someone is right beside me. A dark shape looming in the alley. Is it Julian? Or mm, oh not someone else. The form is certainly human, though enormous in size. Their flesh scored with scars, clean and jagged, shallow and deep. Showed in a pop in a pall of weather beaten furs, it's hard to make out a face. But they are definitely watching me. They stand between me and the road to the palace. Uh, I don't know. Should I like should I walk past them, ignore them, or should I like tell them to move and um, like interact with them? I don't want to walk past, but he might not let me. I take a step forward, watching the figure cautiously. Stormy green eyes follow my movements as I enter the alley, but the stranger makes no move. A voice like distant thunder rumbles from beneath their robes. You are in grave danger. <laughs> The earthly scent of mare rushes over me and I step, stop in my tracks. You will return uninvited. We will offer you a gift when you need it most. Turn away. Turn it away or you will fall into his hand. Just like the rest of us. I'm then trying to process what I just heard. There is a shuffling behind me, the dragging of a rough cloth and chains. And then silence. I look up and down the foggy alley. I left the shop and then wasn't someone else here just now? I shake with the fading thought. I don't have time to dawdle. The Count is suspecting me. Did, did he like wipe my memory? Wipe my memory or something? Again, deeply, I continue towards the narrow, mossy steps to the marketplace. It's early yet, and the marketplace is already wide awake. All around me are the sounds of bartering laughter, vendors hawking their waves. A voice I know well calls out to me over the sea of noise. Has he have you eaten? I got the pumpkin loaf you like an oven won't be long now. Come sit down and talk for a while. As if the air in my stomach twists in hunger. Then again, I should be careful of the time. Mmm. Should I stay for bread or should I just leave? Um How long would it take if I stay for bread? The baker's son's speckled face lights up with a broad smile. He leads me into at the booth and a warm spicy scent drowns me. It's only like one loaf, right? As I settle into the back wall, um, he offers me a steaming tin cup. And where is Azra sleeping in? I sip my hot and empty drink. He's on a journey. Ah, where is he off to this time? I shrug. The baker gives me an odd look. He didn't tell you? I look down at my, into my cup, watching steam curls and twists as it rises. Please. <laughs> he wasn't. He was acting strange. The baker sighs, folding his arms over his chest. So he's off on some mysterious journey. That's nothing new. But what of your mysterious journey, I may ask? Shaking from my reverie. Re 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 <laughs> I don't know, I can't say that. Oh, I blink up at him startled. There have been whispers all morning, you know? They say the countess of Discord rose into the neighborhood round dawn. He gives me a meaningful look, clearly fishing for gossip. But I smile and shake my head, downing my drink. How's that bread coming along? May you see as it ever, you and Azra both. The baker goes to the small wood stove to check. They are all wrapped up to the road. I place a coin on the table and I hand off my empty cup. Now run along. Don't keep the countess waiting. I give a backwards wave and head back out into the full traffic. How did he know I was meeting the countess? Hmm. As I climb the well-worn steps, something catches my eye. A foot and his booth tucked away in a shady corner. How nostalgic. Azra once operated a, of a place just like it. As I'm lost in my musings, a patron emerges from the booth. Key numbers, check groceries. I don't notice them backing into me until we crash into each other. Ah! The impact makes me stumble, teetering on the edge of a step. I also upset the basket balance on the stranger's hip, which sends a dozen pomegranates rolling down the stairs. Oh, perfect, as if I wasn't already late. Help. I'm gonna help, I don't wanna start drama. I drop into a crouch beside the stranger to help. I spot a pomegranate as it's about to be sunk under a straight hoof and swipe it at the last second. When I hand it back to the stranger, their eyes sparkle with delight. Oh, thank you, how sweet of you to help. And after I bumped into you the first, in the first place, together we hunt down the rest of the pomegranates. They're a little bruised, but no worse than for wear. Well, I can't thank you enough. They offer me a hand. The skin of their small palm is rubs against mine, calloused. Probably shouldn't do this, but for being it off on the sleeve, they offer me a fruit from the basket. And I accept that the stranger gives me a smile that warms my chest. Take care, alright, I'll see you around. And the stranger eyes widen when they take a closer look at me. Wee, 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 I know you. 
Uh, I'm at a loss. I have no idea who they are. You can't see the magician. Count Nia said we were expecting you. We? You can call me Portia. I'm the lady's head servant. Oh, that's why your hands were calloused. Oh, all the pieces click together. The pomegranates were for the palace. And Portia's name rings a bell. I think I've heard of her through gossip in the market. Well, how lucky were we? Come on, I'll show you the quickest path to the palace. Okay. As the sun journeys across the sky, Portia and I climb um, star stair after stair, seemingly infinite stair. The higher we ascend, the fewer travelers we count along the way. By the time we reach the top, I can barely walk. Though Portia seems as energetic as ever, she pauses to let me catch my, catch my breath. Oh, sorry, I can't talk today. <laughs> Cassie, I'm glad you're here. The Countess can use good help. And you look like a good sort to me. When we reach the palace, it's near dark. Before me is a towering gate of twisted iron. Beyond that, the palace rises in a swirl of glittering spires. Two guards stand on either side of the gate, their eyes bending from behind their helmets. They lower their weapons when they see Portia. Ludovico, but Mila, this is Cassie. She'd be staying as our guest. Cassie, Ludovico, and Bold, Mila. Mila, I don't. <laughs> the guards nod at me. They're still posture relaxing. In unison, they push away the heavy iron gate. After you, Cassie. The gate slams shut behind me, and there is no turning back. Portia leads me across a long, steep bridge. Some kind of eel twists through the swirling water below, going like a bloodless ghost. Portia tugs on my arm, leading me away from the edge of the bridge. Come on, we don't want to keep Milady waiting. As we approach the intricate doors, anxiety starts to rise like bubbles coming into a boil within me. Is this wise? What awaits me in this fortress so far from home? Too soon we are standing before the doors. Here we are. She springs her fist against the copper plating, three skull rattling strikes. As the last echoes fade, the pendulous door springs in me. Okay, um, so the third, the Empress. Inside the palace, the floors, walls, and steep ceilings are all clean cut, polished stone. Serving so a blue feather cap comes sweeping up to us. With a deep bow, they pass me and dash to Portia's side. Chamberlain, how are we doing? On time. Terribly late. The fifth course is over. Her ladyship is in, in the most unhappy state. Where to choose her life and hands the servant in her fruit basket? Have this Mellor's Virtual of the Golden Goose. The servant departs at a hasty clip, disappearing behind a panel in the wall, which sides seamlessly shut. Too bad I escort you directly to the dining room. Dining room? Was I to dine with the Countess? Why don't tell me you thought we wouldn't feed you? I have them to keep up with their pers pers uh, purposeful strides. Soon we are standing before a fine mahogany door. Porsche opens the door, leading me inside. Which scents linger in the air, unfamiliar and tantalizing. Ah, Cassie, welcome to the palace. Have a seat, you're too late for dinner, I'm afraid. She brings her glass to her lips. Wow, this music sounds familiar. Where did I, where did I hear it from? She brings her glass to her lips and drinks deeply. Porsche leads me into my seat. Another servant moves what might, might have been my plate. I was beginning to think you had forgotten my invitation, but perhaps you are simply accustomed, not accustomed to travel. You look exhausted, why? I can see your cheeks gaining from here. Now it's down to her class and forced her pieces to start with a bottle of em... and robed in shimmering foil. Ah, oh, Portia, how thoughtful you. My pleasure, my lady. Portia fills both of her glasses and the countess takes a sip of hers. A golden goose, a marvelous choice, Portia. Reach for my own glass to cover the awkward moment, and stop, transfixed by the strange painting before me. The scene is that um, the meal shared amongst a host of figures with the heads of beasts. The, tab the table is laid with small animals provided by a central character with the head of a goat. Rays of gold glitters around his head, and his red eyes are strikingly lifelike. Do you like it, Cassie, the painting? Yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> the countess raises shapely brows, eyes flashing at me over the rim of her glass. Fascinating! Perhaps you share my husband's unusual tastes. Oh, I didn't know you were married. That's too bad. Nadia's husband, Count Lucio, rather the late Count Lucio. Oh, he's the goat in the middle, of course, even the proprietor. 
Then she had the populace eating out of the palm of his hand, much like the painting, I suppose. Oh, so she's not married anymore. Whatever he offered, whatever he offered, the people gobbled it up. They worshipped him. My husband was particularly loved for his yearly masquerade. She sat down her glass, holding her hands and resting her chin upon them. Do you ever attend, Kelsey? The whole city came alive for the masquerade. Revelry took hold of hearts, young and old. All in celebration of this year's birthday, and what the celebration? What a celebration when he opened the palace gates to all. Countless sighs, watching the wine swirl on her glass. Such a fond memory for many, and now it's shrewd in sorrow, a terrible shock to the guests. Oh no, you miss him. What happened to him? Found her host murdered so violently at the last masquerade. Oh, uh, okay. Wait, who murdered him? The servant lowers her eyes. I too have brought my gaze back to the painting. My poor husband burned alive in his own bed. Oh, now it's a celebration of his birthday. What did he do to invite such hatred? After such a shocking scene, guests of the palace have been scarce. Oh no, what happened? I look away from the portrait just in time to meet the Countess' keen gaze. But now that you are here, now that I am here, she says it with such gravity, such confidence. Countess, what does any of this have to do with me? Cassie, yeah, the masquerade is precisely why I called you here. This year I tend to hold the masquerade once more. And so you can find the murderer? They stare at her. She does every servant in the room. So does every servant in the room. How? Why? The best of these the best of these and Lucia's honor will be more fantastical. Fanatical. Excuse me. Fantastical than ever. There is but one loose end in need of time. Count Lucia's murder still runs free to this day. Dr. Julian Deverack, my husband's former physician. I right, think he killed him? I sit very still, suddenly pulled all over. Dr. Julian Del Delvorak, now I remember the name of the want on the wanted posters. Oh, I met him! No wonder he had that mask of the, of the bird. Or the... I don't know that. I don't know exactly who broke into my shop. Dr. Deverack confessed to the crime when we caught him. All that's up is his sentence. So why didn't he get put away? Execution by hanging. There's a terrible crash. Portia's face was stricken with horror. At her feet, the broken remnants of the golden goose are seeping into the floor. Portia! Forgive me, my lady's slippery hands. You are forgiven. Aw, she, she's quite a nice, um, um, ruler to her servants. Two servants rushed to her aid, sweeping away the shadow mass with wind sprint speed. This is where you come in, Cassie. De Dr. Deverack has been very elusive. So you want me to, like, talk to him, get him to admit what he did? Something? But you have quite the reputation. Whom has it that you have surpassed even your master, Azra? I myself see the future in dreams whether I like it or not. And this is how that you are the one who will find- This is how I know that you are the one who will find Dr. Deverack. I've already found him. And if we find him? The founder sits down a glass. I don't want to like, um, argue with the people. If we find him, we'll bring him before the people so that they, they, that all may see his long way to punishment. And so to commence the festivities, the doctor will die in the gallows for his terrible crime. The countess rises. On instinct, I rise as well. Portia. Portia? Yes, my lady? Show Cassie to the guest quarters. I imagine there is much to ponder before the night is out. Right away, my lady. Portia pulls me to my feet and with a humble bow whisks me to the doorway. I don't think he did it. <laughs> If they're doing- if they're putting all this, like, effort into, like, getting him to admit that he did it, I think he might be covering for someone. Um, because- or maybe- I don't know, he could have done it and then, like, escaped because he didn't want to be killed, or I don't know. Portia's cried as she ushers me down the hall towards my room. After a few turns, we pass a wide staircase spelled in shadow. A draft rushes down from the floor above, quickly my skin. It's cold and it smells of ash. Built up on the bottom step are two large, lanky dogs. Baphomet's eyes fix upon me and they rise away without sound. Tonight they look as though they could strike at any moment, I sense no ill intent. I hold up my hand and they approach to snip it. Their huffing breaths tickle my skin and their tails slowly start writing. Well, this is bizarre. They never take kindly to strangers. Well, maybe on dog whisper. It's just how, how they were trained, but I've never seen them act like this. Uh, Slim the snow is brushed against my sides, and the dog investigates me further. That's why they draw back, looking at me expectantly. But then, on a whim, I reach out with my hand um, over the smaller one and still be killed. I don't I could ignore them, but I don't 
They like me, so wouldn't do that if I were you. The dog rears back from my hand or from force of panic, panic tone, I'm not sure. Sorry, they're a little unpredictable. They seem to like you, but I'd rather you keep that hand. Okay. The hounds trot uh, dutifully back to their spot. They nearly blend into the marble. Oh no, wonder why they're like this. Oh, no wonder they're like this. They haven't had the chamom chamomile cakes. She looks nervously from me to the two dogs, still as statues. Wait here, Cassie, and it's probably best to keep distance from them. I'll be right back with those cakes. What, does that mean something's gonna happen to me? <laughs> because it only happens when someone's left alone, some bad stuff happens. Crystal sweeps through a sliding panel on the wall in the film the hallway with, with the dogs. I feel the bigger ones in my side ins insistently. Where I, when I look down, it simply pulls back and stares. Then a small one is sipping my other side, humping samples in my cell in the scent. I whirl around. And it's just back on its haunches, watching me uh, innocently. Cheeky. As I look into its one sanguine eye, an unsettling sensation dribbles through my body like a wave of fear. Voice? A guest? I step back, gaze staring up and down the corridor. Wait. Can I listen to, um, like, animals? The voice was coming from the top of the stairs. I can only see so far into the hollow room. Oh, for it wasn't the dogs or something else. But there's no one there. I nearly jump when I feel like uh, yanking at my garments. The dogs, the teeth are buried in my clothes. I'm relenting as they drag me onto the stairs. I trip with the first few steps and their tails start wagging. Are they giving me to their master or something? Hey! I try to wrench myself free, but the two dogs tug stubbornly. The dogs only let me go to the top of the stairs. Don't let me go at the top of the stairs. Farm walls are fridge stone and the air smells of ash. No, it's, it's dark up here. My head's spinning, and I hardly feel the chill in the air. Though my heart is hammering, I summon a weak limper of light in my palm. I look around for the dogs, but they're nowhere to be seen. There's a door head partway open, inside a deeper darkness wall and the feeble rays of light. Use, okay, so I can use coins to access extra content, and I can tap the bandit. So if I want to enter the room, I have to use 50 coins, but if I want to turn back, I don't use coins. Hmm, I wonder what I should do. Uh, I'm gonna enter the room. I'm gonna confirm. Yeah. The magic in my palm shrinks to a fluttering glow when I step through the doorway. Coming from the hall, it's warm inside. Thick air has a strongly peppery taste. Because yeah, if the dogs needed me to, to see something, then I should see it, right? Okay. A heavily canopy bed stretches midway across the room. I cast an extravagant suit of armor, a marble writing desk with a white peacock feather pen, all blanketed in ash. My, um, my light flickers over a portrait of the wall twice my height. Is that Lucio? My dim light stretches up the canvas. Though it's hard to see, I have no doubt the painting of the painting subject. Count Lucio, he looks younger than I expected, or the portrait is old. But perhaps the art of his catering to his vanity. The red of his coat is the cardinal hue from the painting in the dining room. The golden arm, a marvel of alchemical art. The fur hanging from his haughty shoulders look impossibly fine, and... Go on, touch it. Oh god, is he talking to me like a ghost? <clears throat> a miasma of thick scorching air pierces my hand with the portrait. But I feel nothing but ash and fingers. There is a sneaking inside my head as a haze settles over my mind. Nothing like a real thing, seeing and able to feel. It's such a sweet torture. One foot like, uh, like an ember radiates at the back of my neck. Imagine my palm reacts, it's close, stretching past my fingers and down my wrist. Ah, the strange sensation subsides and the voice goes fainter, even wistful. There, in your energy, oh, it's him. Could you be? The haze vanishes from my mind, I reel back from the portrait. Something is soft meets the back of my knees, and I fall through the folds of dusty velvet into the massive bed. Great pommels of ash blow around me, my back hits the bed covers. This is Count Lucio's bed, right where he was murdered, incinerated. Oh no, am I gonna die? In this fine ash, in my eyes, in my nose, in my mouth, it's all of me. It's what I left of him. Oh gosh. I toss the hand around my mouth, smoothing a scream as I struggle to stand. Why so soon? You're no fun. The bo that voice echoes from every corner of the room. You shouldn't have went in. And from within my mind. Who are you? The temperature drops my hurried breath turning into fine mist. I hear shifting in the fine ash and we cry unlike anything a human would make. Nobody, nobody at all. An unseen breeze moves past me, tickling the sum of the canopy. Towards the portrait. Now this specimen of a man. He was somebody. 
much trails off, the room feels normal once again. I stumble to my feet and make a break for the door. Leading into a room, I continue down the hall, searching the vague darkness for any way out. The portraits on the walls watch me run with cold, aristocratic, aristocratic stairs. Come back, come back. Against all good sense, I stop and turn around. No, leave! I only see for a moment a silhouette stark against the wall of high windows, frosted with smoke. Claws horns and hooves like onks. The white face of a goat with red eyes fixed gleefully on me. I blink and it's gone. I hear clambering off to the side, the creak of a door, and then silence. You know, does that count Lucio like in like um his um his persona or something? I don't even know. Like it might be him. Or it might be like part of him that like is like alive still. By the time I stumble down the stairs, disoriented Porsche is looking around corners for me. There you are. She says with a fine powdery ash courting me from head to toe. What? Why are you covered in ash? What do those naughty dogs do? She produces a plain white handkerchief and hands it to me. All I can muster is a day's nod of thanks as I dust myself off. My mind feels fogged, struggling to make sense of the shadows I saw, the whispers I heard. Portia takes me gently by the elbow, helping me brush off the last of the ash. You know, I'm just going to leave these cakes right here. Let's get you to bed. I follow at Portia's heels until we arrive at our destination. Thankfully, it isn't much further. She swings open the door with a sweeping gesture. These will be your quarters, Cassie. You can put your things wherever you like. Breakfast is at sunrise. I'll wake you. My fatigue must be showing. I let my bag fall to the floor. Eyeing the smooth linens, I shudder with exhaustion. You look ready to drop. I'll leave you be. Sleep well, Cassie. Her soft voice trails off and she gently slides the door shut. At once, I burrow into the luxurious sheets. It feels as though I'm weightless. Heart thumping to the rhythm of Porch's study of her distant footfalls, I sink into unconsciousness. Right, and part four, the Emperor. I'm back at the. I'm back on the black stone path, whipped by wind and rust colored sand. The thick dark clouds hanging overhead are heavier than before. But if I'm dreaming again, where is Azra? The unforgiving wind burns my eyes as I search the desolate landscape. Up ahead, too far to reach, Azra is still with the lumbering beast. They stopped a fork in the road. One way goes east, the other west. Azra does not see creature placing a hand on its eye. It turns down the path to the east. Am I, am I like dreaming um, about this or is like what I'm seeing actually what Azra's doing in the moment? Azra walks past and I know at once he is going the wrong way. Not that way, not again. His head turns even from the unclassable distance and I feel eyes meet. Grassy? His voice just long with this on the wind. I can't reach out to him. I have to let him go. He drops his gaze and continues down the westward path fading from my sight. No, Azra. I'm going after him, even, even as my dream is swallowed by seeing him. The sunlight tickles my face. I open my eyes with a groan. Morning, Cassie. Portia sits on a tray of breakfast pastries while I slowly sit up. What a lovely sunrise. Did you sleep well? The Countess wants you to meet her in the library once you've eaten and dressed. Portia sets a neat pile of elegant clothing on the bed beside me. I unfold the top piece, marveling at the way the product moves. We took your old clothes to be laundry, and the lady asked me to provide these for you. I'll be waiting in the hall whenever you're ready. Portia ducks out the door. I move the silky garments aside and, and toss back my bed covers. I eat quickly, not wanting to keep the countess waiting. The pastries are still warm and flaky, each more delicate and whimsical than the last. Then I just roll and pull on my new outfit, fumbling with its clasps and buttons. Ooh, did don't you look nice? The countess has a real eye for fashion. She'd definitely be pleased. Portia stops before a panel on the wall three times my head. It's back to the smooth wood and all the colors of the flame honey. Hard with dizzy in, 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 oh my gosh, I can't see it. In, in, oh my gosh. Okay, I'm not going to say, oh my gosh, I can't see this. <laughs> it's a great tree in, with, in the height of maturity. Its leaves and fruit are inlaid with jewels, precious stones, and mother of pearl. I woke up like really late, to, uh, really early today, so and I went to bed like, really late last night, so I'm kind of I'm kind of out of it. <laughs> it's my lady's own work, beautiful, isn't it? Portia retrieves a ring of keys from her pocket. 
there are about a dozen each carved with the same wood as the panel and each bearing a distinct tool. One by one she finds their locks in the panel. With each key the roots of the tree start to unwind from each other, pulling free from the floor. When all the locks have been turned, the panel folds up on itself, on either side like a fan. There are books everywhere, books widening, widening the walls, winding the walls, reaching for the ceiling. The Countess is waiting for us, seated in her reclining chair. Her eyes glitter with approval when she sees me. Cassie, you look positively radiant. So do you. She gestures us to the towering shelves all around us. Do you read? I nod. The Countess tempers her surprise. Ah, somehow I suspected that you might. It's a great gift to read. Where I come from, it's shared amongst all citizens. But woefully uncommon here. This way, if you please. She leads me deeper into the shelves, where she falls with the jingling ring of peace. I can't stop staring at all the books. My fingers get strung along their spines, but I resist. Cassie, you are my guest. If you should like to return here, you need only ask, but for the moment, Santa stops before an alcove nestled between the shelves. I would have your undivided attention here. A desk stands in a slim ray of daylight, cast from a tiny window. Books, journals, papers, and scrolls cover every inch of the desk. Despite the clutter, everything is carefully organized. Someone placed, uh, someone's place of study preserved in time. This was Dr. Devrek's desk. He was uh, employed at the palace, as was your master, Azra. Are you only being nice to me because you need me for something? That's, that's all, what I'm suspecting, but... Um, we called upon him to concoct a cure for the plague. And then went cold. The red plague, as it was called, took the city like wildfire. He claimed young, old, frail, and strong. There was no way to tell who would succumb. Faces are fair now. I can't even remember the last time I saw a telltale red in the whites of someone's eyes. Those two dogs had red eyes, and that that goat, goat man, had red eyes as well. Oh, does that mean that they that they have the plague? Physicians, scientists, alchemists, fortune tellers, magicians, all were invited in hopes that our resources may aid in their research. Perhaps he was plotting even then, but the doctor accepted our invitation, as did your master, Ezra. Her gaze shifts to the window. It overlooks a large willow tree, which hangs over the fountain in the garden below. I have had the desk and its contents examined laboriously. Nothing of consequence has been found. But perhaps we will make a better use of it, as it is the best lead I can offer. She draws away passion me and performing the air with Jasmine. The search for Dr. Deverick is now in your hands. You may proceed as you see fit. I ask only that you meet with me for dinner this evening. She smiles serenely as moves out the room, forced her following her in the er, following her wake. I am left alone with the doctor's desk. There is a stack of books, a leather bound folio, and scrolls school tucked away in a little row of drawers. Mm. Check the books first. I open a well-loved tome and flip through the pages. It appears to be a surgical guide. Some of the diagrams are stained with old blood. Many of the pages are scrawl scrawled over with the doctor's notes. His handwriting is completely indecipherable. I can't make any sense of it. And I'm more and more importantly, I sense nothing from the books, no languages from the doctor. Alright, let's go to the folio. The folio papers are a little gold with age and thin, almost transparent. A meticulous drawing catches my eye. Its neat lines contrast sharply with the doctor's missing writing. Somehow the patterns and shapes look very familiar, like I've seen them before. I trace one with my fingertip and the hairs on my arm stand on end. Or is, is it like the magic symbols or whatever? There, an echo of desperation and a single-minded purpose. It's a faint trace at best, but I can sense what the doctor is feeling when he made these drawings. I roll the drawing into a tight scroll and sew it in my bag. This fragile piece of paper, it's something the doctor cared about, something with a connection to him. A surge of excitement and apprehension rushes through me. I can, I can use this with the scroll and my magic to assist me, I might be able to find him. I glance out the window at the sky, it's a bit past noon. If I'm quick, I should be back in time for dinner with the Countess. And the sun starts dipping in the sky as I make my way back into the city. My breath goes short as tremors of anxiety radiate from my, radiate from my gut, spreading to, to my fingertips. I haven't done magic like this on my own, I've always had Ezra with me before. Ezra, memories of his familiar voice to my mind. Start with your breath, follow with your heart, and be present. Finding the calm I need, I gather up all my magic, holding the scroll in both hands. A tingling sensation grows at the base of my neck, I follow the feeling away from the palace to the city streets. I end up in a narrow, slippery street 
off the south end of Vesuvia. Its shabby stones are layered like scales. Professor departments line the passage, and murky reddish water swirls in the sluggish canal. Suddenly, a door in front of me swings open, casting warm light down three jagged stone steps. Oh, I'll be back, just stepping out for some air. I freeze in this step, my heart leaping into my throat. My spell worked! But I hadn't thought about what I'd do when I found him. I try to back away quietly, but something catches my heel, toppling me into an empty barrel. The next thing I know, I'm staring at the sky, limbs failing and failing lucidly as quick as root steps approach. Hello, that was quite a tumble. Are you alright? The doctor leans over the barrel, extending a hand. He rears back when he sees my face. The shopkeep? What are you doing here? Come on, Oxy Daisy. A firm grip encircles each of my wrists, and I'm hauled off the barrel like a snail struck from its shell. I stagger forward into the doctor's broad, bleeding chest. For a moment, his eyes meet mine and surprise at our sudden proximity. Then, with a friendly pat to my arms, he releases me. I take a good look at my surroundings for the first time. We're behind a tavern, well hidden from the street. Painted on the door is a cackling blackbird lying back on a crescent moon. On the righty raven it reads, Dare I ask what brings you to this neck of the woods? I open my mouth, but no words come out. How do I even begin to explain? Doctor gives me an annoying look and casts a glance to open the door. It's warm light glows between us. He, he turns me with a glint in his eye. Rumor has it that you're working for the palace. I'm sure well by now you've heard some interesting stories about me. I nod, that much is true. If a ghost understatement. But you haven't heard my side of the tale, have you? That's true too. All my knowledge is from the Countess account, if I uh, the one produce and the metal rumors. Besides, I do still owe you for the reading. Are you thirsty, my treat? Uh, I guess I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. His weight splits into a brilliant drink. Oh, fantastic. Please allow me. He beckons me to the steps, uh, up the steps to the door, easing it open and leading me through the, into the warmth inside. It's not even sundown, but the tavern is in full swing. The, noises, the noise is cacophonous. The barkeep, wide scarf face, and barrel armed gives the doctor a cheap pusillet when we walk by. Tackling drunkard swings out a wooden leg, which Dr. Debrock politely pushes away. Treating my escort guides me to a uh, booth in the back. You make yourself comfortable. I'll be right back. He breezes past me towards the bar. I try to sit, sit still as I look around. Nearby, a pair of old crones are hunched over a card game, attended by a squabbling crowd. Up at the bar, the doctor chats with the barkeep. They both erupt into peals of laughter at some joke. He looks perfectly at me, so different from when I met him at the shop. He turns, making his way back with our drinks. He sets mine before me. He slides into the booth across from me, gulping down his drink with gusto. If you enter the golden liquid in my cup, it smells faintly like fruit. I guess I'll just drink it. I take a sip. It's refreshing, barely sweet, and fizzes on the way down. You know, I never did get your name. Fingers unlocking, interlocking on the table between us, he gives me a look of encouragement. Cassie. Ah, Cassie, what a lovely name. A musical name, Cassie. He offers me his hand, and though I hesitate his mind to place my arm his leather grip, I manage. He smiles broad and through toothy grin. I came right out looking him down in the eye. You said you'd tell me the your side of the story. Oh, I did, didn't I? How careless of me. He laughs at my incredulous expression. <laughs> but I'm in my computer. <laughs> then he leans back to, into the booth, long limbs going every which way. Alright, ask me anything you like. Wordlessly, I reach into my bag and hand him the scroll from the library. Once he starts reading, his smile slides from his face, and he leans over the page, frowning in concentration. The map-like winding patterns draw me in once again. I find myself leaning over the spell for a closer look. I only look away when I feel Julian's eyes on me. Where'd you find this? It was on your desk in the palace library. He looks away, but not before I see a flinch of pain cross his face. Oh well, this is the size of a human brain. The patterns are unique, actually, to each individual. Individual? I mean, his gaze and he sip with I mean to say you've seen individual brains sliced like this. Julian steep, steeples his fingers and rests his chins on his thumbs. His expression is ghastly. There are other drawings, aren't there, at the palace? I nod and he jumps his fingers on his clenched jaw in pure distress. Well, you better put this one back. Trust me, don't notice it's gone. As if he can't stand to look at it in long, he rolls, up and, and rolls it up and hands it to me. I take the scroll and store it in my bag. 
It feels heavier now, as if the page itself took on the weight of his ominous words. Excuse me. Whisking those signs away, Julian heads back to the bar. Show bickering erupts from the card playing crones table. Julian whispers to one of the crones as he passes by and taps a single card in his hand. Card is played, fall, uh, throwing the card into chaos. Julian ducks, away. Julian ducks away just as someone douses him with their drink. He's still wiping it off, chuckling when he returns to his seat. You wouldn't think I know better than to get involved. You would think. I raise an eyebrow, he's not wearing a mask here, and everyone seems to know him. You're not worried about being seen? Here, no, 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 I'm not I'm not too worried. Folks around here aren't known to uh, oblige a wants in which is the palace. Even the raven spends his time scouting for guards obsessively. Julian scans the smoky raptors while I process what he told me. It's a little surprising. Wherever and I live, the guards are treated with reverence and fear in no small measure. Suddenly, the raven bursts through a dusty window overhead, flying in loops with a guttural shriek. The bird beats himself against a string of bells, and the tavern erupts in chaos. Guards! Pause! Guards! Pigeons claw their way out every door and window, placing guards tossed, placing cards tossed, playing cards tossed and floating in the air. Julian scoops me boldly from my seat and rushes me out the back door into the alley. It's getting cold and the sun's almost set completely. The doors cast a, frank, uh, a frantic glance up and down the alley before crowding me into the shadows. You'll be able to find your way, yes. The guards aren't after you. I nod, he claps his, my upper arms and looks deep into my eyes. Thanks for not. Thanks for not. Well, thanks, Cassie. He turns and vanishes, leaving me all alone in the silent, sh shuttered alley. Now, what do I do? I thought Julian might give me answers, but all I have are more thrilling questions. Hey, you there. I roll around as two armed guards appear on the alley and retreats. They march towards me, but when they're close enough to see my face, they stop. Oh, the Count is magician. The guard gives me a short, sharp bow. Ahem, I'm Ludovico. We met yesterday at the gates. I'm not trying to summon up some confidence. Yes, I'm supposed to dine with the Countess again tonight, but it's getting late. Ludovico briskly raise, waves off my unasked question. Unasked question. We'll hail you a carriage back. Don't want to keep the Countess waiting. He leads me back to a broader street. Hale splitted carriage and closes the door behind me. The palace looms over the carriage as it approaches a white monolith against the twinkling night sky. Porsche is waiting for me at the gates, ready to help me out of the carriage. She's unusually quiet, not at all her usual cheerful self. I keep I keep silent as well, occupied by a tangle of thoughts of my own. The grand doors swing open as we arrive to reveal an extravagant meal, piled high upon the long table. Everything is richly seasoned with rare spices. I can recognize the scent of saffron wafting towards me. You're right on time, Cassie. Hope your day was fruitful. The servant seats me and fills my glass with a pale rose beverage. The delicate floral aroma reminds me of the Countess perfume. First, let us attend to some small mods. My count my courtiers are most eager to meet you. I shall introduce you to them tomorrow afternoon. They will want to know everything about you, but you choose wisely what you wish to tell. I will be informing them of the masquerade as well. I imagine they will be ecstatic. I nod slowly as you chew my food. The ways of the court are foreign to me, but I can trust at the very least that the Countess won't allow me to be an embarrassment. And tomorrow at noon, Portia will lead a rent new to the town's greater not the masquerade. Once the townspeople hear word will spread on its own, and then it shall be out of our hands. I imagine the cows would be eager to see Count Lucio's murderer, murderer hang. I think of Julian bathed in the warm welcoming light of the tavern swinging from the gallows. My heart grows cold at the image, but I'm careful not to let it show my face. But these are tomorrow's matters. Tonight, Cassie, I have questions. Questions? I brace myself with the inevitable queries about where I went, what I've been doing, Yes, I wish to become familiar with you. Her words catch me off guard. I didn't expect to have any interest in who I was. Let's be strangers no longer. May tonight be the beginning of a valuable friendship. He starts with, the simple, with simple questions. How I enjoyed the town, my daily going, goings on, my favorite thing to eat. I ask her questions in return and learn that her favorite food is spiced swordfish. In Paraka, spiced swordfish is a summer dish. I would hardly suffer a warm night without it. Kakara, a, a vast land in the north, the campus home, although I had thought it was only rumor. The kitchen does try to humor my request, but alas, they can never seem to spice it quite right. 
Do you ever miss living there? The Countess looks thoughtfully down to her glass, elegant fingers curled delicately around the stem. Perhaps, I don't think I'd ever return to Praclara, but there are things I miss about my home. Often when I was feeling morose, I would take a walk down to the white beaches of my homeland. Observing the opalescent waves crash over the sands would soothe my worried soul. The bittersweet expression on her face as she speaks of her homeland makes her look young, years younger. And those other servants are listening as they work, watching the Countess and I, I with wondering eyes. Well, if I were to reminisce, perhaps we should do some, somewhere more private. Would you care to join me on the veranda for a night, Cap? She looks down at me, a soft smile tickling at her lips. Just the two of us. Then she holds her hand out towards me, waiting for me. Can't. Oh, I can actually. Oh yeah, I'll join her for a nightcap. I take her hand with trepid uh, trepidation. <laughs> she gives it warmly and friendly looking face as we head out to the veranda. Okay, so I think we're almost done. What? Who might be? Breeze greets us. The star-filled sky is bright and vast overhead. No servants follow us. It's just Nadia and me and the brilliant stars overhead. Yeah, this this video is getting really long. Sorry, guys. It should be under an hour if I if I um pick up this. Have a seat. I sit all down to a plush chair and at her order, shifting a little to get comfortable. She picks up a crystal decanter filled with a pale liquid and pours us both a glass. Elderflower Cordell, one of my favorites. There's a silence, not quite comfortable. Then Nadia turns her gaze from the garden to me and gives me one smile. You are quite different from how I imagined you. I will admit, I found your presence quite intriguing. Somehow the Countess has a way of making me feel at ease and nervous at the same time. In town, there are whispers that the Countess Nadia is a tyrant, but the woman in front of me seems genuine, kind, and a little lonely. Tell me, Cassie, why did you come to the palace? Why did you to help me? I was curious. Curious, and have you satisfied that curiosity? A long tendril of hair falls in her face as she tilts her head waiting for the answer. But I don't have one, not yet. I only have more questions. Especially when I sit with a like-minded individual. There are so many questions in this world. Perhaps we can discover some answers together. Her gaze reaches over me for a moment long as I linger on her face. Do you have any more questions for me, Cassie? I know you are free to speak. I know that you are free to speak my presence. I have a lot of questions for Nadia, but I asked I ask them now. If I ask them now, all the boy will never leave the land up. For now, I just need to know. Uh, why me? It's hard not to wonder what made the Countess come to my door. She went to the gym, but she already put so much faith in me. A prudent question, Cassie. You're wise to wonder at my motives. When I came to your doctor, uh, to your door, I was looking for an answer. I thought you might be it. I, if I had arrived that night and found you waiting, I would not have invited you here. And I found you wanting, I would not invite you here. But there is something about you. I believe you're worth the risk. Nadia drains the rest of her poor dial. Yes. Were, were you frightened to see me? I wonder. You certainly seem startled. But you have nothing to fear, I assure you. I have no patience for the swindlers who crawl the market, hang on weak and weary souls. But what I feel from you is different. It's intriguing and promising. She reaches out, taking one of my hands and examining it carefully. She runs her fingers over the lines in my palm. Then she looks up at me, a little grimmer of hope in her eyes. Are we gonna kiss? I do not think you would disappoint me. Nadia pauses and then slowly brings my hand to her lips, brushing a feather light kiss against it. Oh, so cute. It seems you have had a long day. I won't keep you any longer. Thank you for coming to the palace. My dreams did not lead me astray. Then she smiles and picks up a small silver belt. It's hand carved. Its handle carved into the shape of a swan's neck and wings it. The door to the veranda opens immediately up as Portia bustles in. You rang, my lady? I did. Please request through the guest room. Of course, my lady. I can almost swear I see Nadia wink at me as, as I leave. <laughs> I think something's gonna happen between us. The walk back to the guest room is less eventful tonight. Mercedes and Milk Choir are nowhere to be seen. Our first steps echo in the empty hall as Portia walks truthfully beside me. Things are a lot more interesting around here since you showed up. All that room is floating around, my goodness, you think you had nothing to, nothing to do but chat. Do you hear a lot of rumors? It's my job to know who and what's happening around here. I 
It seems servants came during the day to tidy up. They placed a fresh pitcher of water on the desk. Incense burned by the window, fill filling the room with hazy swirls of wood and spice. When I dropped my bag at the foot of the bed, the scroll from Julian just rolls out. Portia spots it. She looks at this to try and dying to ask a question, but it falters before it can escape her lips. You seem concerned. Concerned? Me? Maybe. It's just the doctor. He can't be the only suspect, right? Just between you and me, I think Count Lucio had a lot of enemies, too. I wasn't working here when it happened. I only had rumors of what went on that night. Just keep your eyes peeled for anything strange, alright? Then she smiles, the worry clean from her face. She leans in close to me, voice slow. I actually already am um, experienced something strange, but... You know, if you're not too tired yet, I could show you around the palace. There's a lot of interesting things on the grounds, so maybe we could show you some secrets. If you think you can handle them. She's teasing me, she gives me another wink and tilts her head waiting for an answer. Mm, I can't. I'm just sad too tired. I get it. You had a long day and a lot on your mind. Get some rest. Tomorrow my lady wants you to join us in town to announce the masquerade. I'll be back at dawn. Don't sleep in. With that, she's gone, leaving me alone with my thoughts. The last okay so I have one more um one more chapter or well, mini chapter of the prologue so I'm gonna just try to do that one okay so um chapter uh, part five be here friend so you weren't gonna be too long so I don't want this video to go on for too long um it's the morning of the masquerade announcement I need to be back in the square for it at noon but for now I'm checking in on the shop I want I would I want I want supplies from investigation, regents, herbs, ones of Astra's magic books. Hoping hopping off the steps, I press my palm to the door and release the singing spell. I spot a small leather pouch resting on the stoop. Someone left this for me. Picking the knot, um, I open the pouch. Inside is a magic mixture. Myrrh is strongest, but there are other herbs a um, mixture for protection. I cast a glance to either side of the street, but there is no one nearby. I fetch my keys and turn the locks. Just as I lean on the door, it swings open and I nearly cough into the last person I expected to see. Dr. Deverack. The sign of him freezes me in my tracks, the pouch dripping from my nervous, nerveless fingers. I struggle to speak, but he beats me to it. Well, hello there. Fancy seeing you here. Uh -huh, maybe not so surprising. I uh, was in the neighborhood. And you look are splendid, marvelous. I'll stop wringing my hands. <laughs> For a moment, I think about calling the guards, uh, but I hesitate. This is the second time he's been in my shop. Will the guards think I've been harboring, uh, harboring him? Not really sure. I fixed him with a narrow gaze. What are you after? You've broken in twice now. Why, I'm not after anything. Why would I be? Oh, I hope you don't think I'm a thief. I'm a lot of things, but not, but not that. But you wouldn't take my word for it, would you? To my surprise, the doctor strikes off his overcoat and starts to unbutton his waistcoat. He throws it open with a flutter, arms outstretched, palm up, and sends up its uh, submission. Search me. If you find anything of yours, I'll show myself to the stocks. Go ahead, search until you're satisfied. He lowers his eye, presenting himself for inspection. The sight makes me go hot up the ears, embarrassed. That'd be embarrassed too. <laughs> no, I don't want that one down, no thank you. <laughs> I'll pass. Oh, you're sure? Well, I'll write the offer stands. Besides, I won't find what I'm looking for here. You know that much now. Doctor makes quick word of his buttons, retrieves his overcoat, and swings it over his shoulders again. Well, I'm sure you have things to do, so I'll just be getting out of your way. He takes a wide step, contouring his long form around the pass. His broad grin takes only seconds to fade before shock takes over his features. I look carefully over my shoulder. Portia, she must have come to find me, but she pays my, you know, no attention at all. All of her focus, the suspended disbelief in her wide eyes is on the man beside me. When she speaks the word that escapes her sounds different and unusual voice from the dust of her heart. Ilya? Who? <laughs> Portia stumbles and runs to the steps back to the wall as she throws herself at the doctor. Oh no! Were they together? Oh yeah, is, that is it really you? The shaking hands come to either side of his face. His eyes, his eyes start to shine. Oh yeah, he only has one eye. <laughs> it's me. You, you. You bastard, why are you doing here? I don't know, but are you trying to get yourself killed? Oh, is, is that why you're- is that why she's so- She's so insistent that there's other suspects that he didn't do it? The fingers curl, tugging at his ears and drawing a shameful wince. You've grown up strong, Kasha. I'm sorry I wasn't there to see it. 
Oh, I show you. Oh, I'll show you. Sorry, you, you unbelievable, Cassie. She was just drilling in tears and sees this as Paula tugging him off to the shop. All right, I'll catch up with you later. Without further ado, Portia follows the founding doctor down a nearby alley, leading him to Ponder. Can't they see my family? I enter my shop and head straight for the back room. Oh, the family, they're not together. They, they both have red hair. Okay. I think you're over Azra's possessions, his clothing and magical relics, comforted by his smoky scent. But I can't stay long, I'm inspected in the square. I collect the magical components I need, but the book is nowhere to be found. It's one of Azra's. Did he take it with him when he left? Did, um, Mr. Davarak pick it? Before I know it, the sun is high in the sky. A distant clock tolls told the hour, shocking me to my feet. The announcement. Right in my lip and vexation, I abandon my search and close up shop, headed for the safe square. The square is dumped and packed. Smaller folk and latecomers are looking at the thermometer for a better view. Pleasant small egg camp place is watching from nearby. Ahem, hear ye, hear ye. This is announcement from your Countess Nadia. Oh, on the anniversary of the passing of your beloved Count Lucio, the Countess will open the house gates. That's right, folks. All of us are invited. Not to mourn, but to celebrate the spirit of the dearly departed Count. A ripple of loud excitement passes through the crowd. At its edge, I follow the fami familiar scent, Myrrh. Wait, is it that guy that was in the alley? The little crush dropped on my stopped doorstep comes to mind. And then I come upon a figure, hulking hulk, hulk, in size. Now there he is. Their eyes are shadowed under a hood and a heavy brow. Through the excitement in the square, so though the incitement in the square is growing, the figure looks more uh, like a harboring of despair. I'll be ma a mas it'll be masqueraded like no other before. Spread the word. Tell your friends you won't want to miss this. As the crowd erupts, the massive stranger moves down a side street, escaping with the sun of myrrh. A stranger's lumbering pace is easy to match. I, kept, I catch up halfway down the street. Hey, where are you going? They turn slowly as if they dread the sight of me. Blind me to the slaughter just like the rest of you. What do you mean? Please speak plainly. It doesn't matter what I say, my words won't last, they never do. A stranger shuffles away, chained droutly. My thoughts waste. If they left the protection spell at the shop, did Azra send them? I'm just gonna let them go. With a suffering look, the stranger disappears into the misty shadows of the afternoon alley. I head back towards the servant wagon where Portia is touching flower petals and rice on the dancing city folk. Cassie, there you are. Would you look at this crowd? No incidents back at the shop, I hope. Nothing out of the ordinary? Her smile has a shade of desperation as she bats her eyes clean me. I open my mouth to answer, but we're just, um, jostled at the wagon and which is like. Wild laughter falls us down the street, swinging like the music masquerade. Cassie, it takes me a moment to register Portia's voice. We're going to be meeting with the coaches and the to palace. I don't know who they are first. Oh yes, that would be really helpful. Well, there's Procurator, Volta, um, Praetor, Vastamil, Pontifex, Vilgora, Quaestor, Valdemar, and Council Valerius. Portia takes their names up rapidly on her fingers. I must look hopelessly lost because she gives my shoulder a reassuring pat. Really, Valerius is the most important. And the lady minds him more, more, more than the rest. The others are a bit eccentric, but I'm sure they'll be kind to you. I'm not sure if Hall's first year expects me to wing out some more strongly a path at those winter fumes. I know we've reached the parlor door by the music and cracking laughter inside. Go on, Cassie, these people can't wait to meet you. The words ground me. People, people, that's all they are. The room is hazy, swimming with elegant pink plumes of smoke. Softly lit figures lay about on um, pillowy couches. Now just sits behind a gleaming car of organ, playing, playing the mind, no mind to the idol to chat around her. But she looks up when I enter her elegant fingers shaking a victorious um, chord. Welcome, Cassie. She turns the pages of her music, nodding to me with encouraging fun. Portia, please introduce our new guest. Announcing Cassie, friends of the palace, and apprentice to Azra the magician. I try to put faces in the music and the recorders are from their competitors. You're Cassie. Oh, you, oh, oh, you're so cute. What a delightful surprise. You were all just talking about you. Uh, sit. No, not with them. With me, Cassie. Not they but oh, they all look kind of strange. They're welcoming gestures. They're welcoming gestures taking by surprise and I expect such enthusiasm. Eager manicured hands drawn me down to the couches and 
into the flow of conversation. The Countess watches from where she plays a pipe organ, drawing contemplative notes home. Tom and Cassie, how was your announcement received? I can only imagine, um, even me, the favorite of the Countess, had no idea. Such a beautiful surprise from our dearest Countess, a masquerade. Ah, and we don't even have to do the work. How lucky Cassie would have to be to get a word um, in the people. Oh, goodness. Oh, my warm, uh -huh, word. How lucky she already is. Uh, to be taken in by the Countess as an unknown apprentice. Patty arches an eyebrow at best and you but says nothing. Risky, risky. So very unlike our thoughtful and meticulous countess. I find Vladimir's voice is soft and chilling and with none of the enthusiasm of the others. Perhaps the countess might inform her enduring court. How exactly she found herself at the witch's door that night. Council Valerius uh, rounds the couch, looking down his nose at me. He spreads his arms trying to adjust the entire room. Or perhaps the witch might tell us herself. Perhaps I might. The Countess' attention returns to the pipe organ as the courtiers swoop down upon me. They seem ravenous for details of our fateful meeting the other night. Go on, tell us everything. We have heard only the gossipy. Did the Countess truly come to you in the death of night, summoning barefoot, tearing through the streets? Eager eyes watch my every move. No, she just knocked on the door. He is my poor Countess, I must know if she was weeping. She wasn't, but the hour was late and the Countess was most insistent. My new companions gather close to me as I spin the tale. Enraptured, they cling to my every word. In my recollections and complete, the Countess ends her practice with an impressive trill. If you all wanted so well, I'd know how that night transpired, I might have simply asked. My headaches had grown worse and I was having some trouble sleeping. As you have been for some time, Countess. Yes, procured everyone. On that night, I woke haunted by a specter of Jane, and no escape from my mind. Indeed, I was seeking someone, anyone who might be of help to me. I was uh, who I was lucky to come with. It was. I was, oh, it was I who was lucky to come across the one I needed so soon. A benevolent universe brought us together, did not Cassie. The glimmering red eyes, red, the glimmering red gaze falls fondly on me and the courtiers shift, suddenly with my intensity. The moment is broken by an airy sigh as Council Larry appears in the blue of his glass. Countess, it pains to hear that you felt you must look um, elsewhere for a sympath uh, sympathetic ear. Should you deem us worthy of your trust? Here as open books to you. He throws his arms wide with a flourish, knocking a pitcher of fragrant wine over the front of my garments. Collective gas sweeps through the room as liquid seeps into my skin and clothes. Countess rises from the organ, her expression murderous. How clumsy of me. Surely you know some hocus pocus termity is still enough. I'm not fully issue, you have exhausted my patience for tonight. All of you out. Tip turning around my splattered form, the cartiers foul sheeps his Sheepless, sheepishly up the door. I met with the countess, her hands resting light on my shoulder. I'm sorry, Cass. You must rid you of these ruined clothes, of course. Tisk, so pettiness. That have taken enough liberties with your wardrobes, please not hesitate. Say what you would like. And as is bare no expense. Portia stands at the ready as countess follows her hands, waiting my request. It seems if Nandi wants me to ask Richard, does she like sharing people in gifts? No, thank you. No, thank you. I don't need anything special. Ah, I thought you might say that. Ah, as humble as ever. Very well. Comfort here is a great importance to me. Portia will escort you to your chambers. You will be bathed and your own garments returned. Oh, Cassie, you are my guest of honor. You could be more selfish if you like. The cooling tones of the organ echo down the hall as Portia leads me back to the guest room. I bathed and returned to my room, a parcel waiting for me by the window. There was a tightly sprawled note on top addressed to me from the Countess. A gift from my dear guest, this emerald which seems to call your name, wear it in good health. And Cassie, you may call me Nadia. The chain slips through my fingers as I hold the jewel in the gradual wave I start to recognize its energy. Am I mistaken? No, I know the feeling too well. It's azure of magic, radiating from the gem in gentle, soothing ripples. If I was able to track Julian earlier, could I somehow find Azure with this? Just the thought makes my heart swell with almost painful hope. I lie and wait until the halls of quiet midnight crowds before I steal out of my room. With the emerald hanging from my neck, it's enveloped in a dreamy, a dreamy calm. The thought of hearing answers voice again. 
wandered through the I wandered through the empty halls and out on the veranda. Though I see the garden shady and lush. From up high I can see that the middle forms a mazy maze of greenery. Silently I descend into the garden path, shrouded in a warm breeze. The musical sound of falling water grows louder and louder. I reach around and around it is a wide gazing pool, and overhead is a rich old willow, willow tree. Hanging from the tree, frost. She flicks her tongue, hovering over the gazing pool. Didn't you go with Azra? What are you doing here? Her weight drops eagerly onto my shoulder, sleek body giving me a friendly squeeze. Was she waiting for me? Did she know I was looking for Azra? I take a seat on the edge of the pool and lean over to peer into the reflective water below. Frost just takes immediate, immediate interest in the emerald, kind of looking after Azra with a minute from my neck. Close my eyes, take a deep breath, a deep, even breath, holding the jewel of my water over the water. When I drop it, light catches every glimmering green flag that sinks the bottom of the pool. Water starts to change, colors remain shape and folding. The longer I come through them, the shape in the water, the more they change. Before I know it, my reflection is fading away, and in this place, you see Azra. I see Azra drawing, uh, drawing water to his face and drinking deeply. He drop the jewel from his hands and dribbles through his image as it strikes the surface. I'm so shocked to see him that I only gave silently, afraid that any sound would break the spell. He shakes out his hair, blinks the water from his eyes, and looks straight at me. Guys, can you hear me? I know I'm barely able to breathe it myself. If this is not well, then how did I? Ever looks uh, as surprised as I am. He even swore close enough that I can see droplets in his eyelashes. Incredible. He laughs. I see now he's sitting cross legged, probably beside a pond. His mouth, a strange breeze from the floor is lying beside him, resting its weight, weighty head on his knees. Ah, and Vasa Bithy looks like she found you all right. I, it wasn't all that, that sure about leaving her, but after re that reading you gave me, I thought I'd trust my intuition. Tall palms bay behind him against the glittering sea of stars, his hair catches starlight in every whirl. Vasa dips her tail in the water, sending, sending tiny ripples across the image. Vasa, you're looking lively. Being around Cassie does that to you, doesn't it? I'm glad that she's here. Frost looks very proud of herself. Now that I'm over the shock of finding her, I'm beyond relieved to have her near. In her affection, Azra looks pleased with some. And it. And I'm glad that you're here, Azra. His face flushes, and the beast on his knee gives one thing strong. I see a willow tree behind you. Are you at the palace? I know I'm not just telling them everything that happens as we parted. The more I speak, the more his eyes can make me interest. Unbelievable. The day that I leave is the day you need me the most. And even then, I didn't really need me at all. I'm glad Frost is with you at least. If anything happens to either of you, I'll know I can't. Uh, I know I can look at that. You look tired? As his expression is sleepy but content, his secret es escapades must have been fulfilling today. I don't feel tired, I was just about to get into the water, but he beat me to it. I roll my eyes while Frost slides oh, a crystal lap to take some fun flicks at the water. What is opening up to you? It may be time for me to do the same. I nearly choked, my face must be a sight because it makes him laugh high and unrestrained. No, oh, really, it's true, I want to start being more honest with you. What's on your mind? Ask me whatever you like. All that I ask is that you start being more honest with me too. His gaze, his gentle gaze rushes over me, bringing me calm, but I keep any questions. Is Nadia to you? I'm not, I've noticed something in the way that the Countess speaks of Azure, like they know each other. Well, she was a dear friend once. We could talk about anything, everything, all night long. We trusted each other for a time, but we, we're strangers now. Why did something happen? Mm, precious, precious friends, precious experiences, you'll be amazed what people can forget. And they don't want to remember. With a deep sigh and a shake of his head as if he was the heavy mood, he smiles. Uh, is there perhaps something else in your mind? Strangely, I search mine with a wordless depth. It's getting late. Is it? Time is strange here. Oh, rest passes. See you again soon. I know you'll find me. I see Azra reaching toward me towards the water, his touch scattered the image and he's on. Foss looks disappointed, curled on the edge of the pool as I rise to my feet. Come, Foss, I know we'll see him again soon. She gives the pool a long look, but reluctantly she slides up my arms rest against me. Presence soothes a strange ache in my chest. With a shake of my head, I gather the slip into my arms and head back inside. Okay, so the next part of your story is about to fall, so you don't have to make the journey alone. I am not ready to begin. Oh, I'm ready, I guess. Okay, so I think that's going to be it for today. Um, so next time I'm going to do um, one of these books. Um, 
So I guess I'm gonna um, try a different character to romance each time and see um, what happens. Um, this is what you're supposed to do. So um, if you guys enjoyed, subscribe. Um, if you like me, um, like the video. Um, if you want to comment which character you think I should um, try to romance um, next or um, what, um, what you think of the video so far. Uh, or the, the series, then um, do so, uh, and I will see you guys next time. Say goodbye.